the concept that content has to be polished is is false. Actually, consumers and people digesting content appreciate when something is more real and genuine. Welcome to the e-commerce coffee break podcast. In today's episode, we discuss how to create short form content for TikTok, Instagram and YouTube shorts. Joining me on the show is John Roman, CEO of Battlebox.com. So let's dive right into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to talk about short, short form video content. We want to talk about TikTok reels shorts and so on and so forth. We have never had this topic and it's so important for the merchants out there. And I have someone on the show today, which I'm really proud about. It's John Roman. He's the CEO of battlebox.com. John has a strong background in building B2B sales teams in telecom and software sectors. He transitioned into e-commerce and investing, eventually joining Battlebox in 2016. So that has been a while. Under his leadership, Battlebox grew rapidly and launched a Netflix series, a series called Southern Survival. And after Battlebox on Carnivore Club was sold in 2021, John led a group to buy back Battlebox in 2023. We'll dive into this a little bit as well. And he is also a fellow podcast host at the ASOM um, podcast. So we have a lot to cover. Hi, John. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing well. Glad to be here. You're around for quite some time with Battlebox. Um, in the pre-chat, we were talking about it. I know um, the brand for a very long time. Our listeners probably don't. Give me a, a short overview of how you got into e-commerce and what Battlebox is about. And then we dive into short form video. Sure. So so my background, as as you had hinted to, was, was B2B sales. Um, so software technology, um, all of which is uh, some form of the subscription model of reoccurring revenue. And um, so I, I knew that aspect of the business, you know, well. So in 2015, I was investing in um, some companies and, and just to clarify, not like, you know, private equity, you know, VC money, like these are very small small checks um and in in my network of of people I've come across not not like institutional or people even looking to raise <clears throat> so had come across um battlebox uh, about a week after launch so super super new and what I loved about it was the reoccurring revenue model that it was it was it was monthly and that's kind of where you know, my brain was at prior. So there was the, just the subscription element, um, you know, reoccurring revenue is easier to forecast. It's easier to scale. Um, it just checks a lot of boxes. And uh, that was, that was the, the initial, um, initial attractiveness of, of it. Obviously, as I got into it, fell in love with it and, and it took a whole new part of my life, but Battlebox as a whole, it's, Think outdoor adventure survival gear. So everything from hiking to camping to something as simple as just preparedness. Um, just, you know, having the monthly box just simply because you want to be prepared for, uh, you know, all kinds of potential scenarios from as simple as the power going out to something as complex as the power grid going out. Um, so just everything in the outdoor and survival space. And um, while we don't position ourselves as, you know, a subscription box where it's just an outdoor and adventure brand. Um, the reality is about 90% of our revenue comes from the monthly recurring subscription box. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's a ton of other companies in the field of outdoor survival and so on and so forth. But Battlebox started relatively early uh, facilitating video in a very, um, I think, entertaining way. And I think that's a, a huge point that made you success, successful as the brand it became. Tell me a little bit on when you started doing video and when you really saw the potential on focusing on video. Sure. So so really, um, everything points to YouTube as being um, both how we discovered it and how we how we executed it. So it's two parts. One, we had a very unique. So this is 2015. Um, call it March 2015, very unique at the time, now best practice, but we knew we wanted to send um, about 30 battle boxes out to YouTubers, people that would review it, give unbiased feedback, 
And we knew that back then, you know, the benefit's going to be, it's giving us almost an organic footprint on, on YouTube. And so that was the first aspect of it. The second aspect um, came quickly, quickly afterwards where we had a, uh, uh, just to date it, 2015 pre-purchase survey. So we'd stop you from purchasing and we'd say, hey, you know, how did you hear about us? And uh, we'd have the usual suspects, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. And uh, we had an other there and you could click the box and put in whatever you wanted. And we saw this influx of um, people writing in uh, Curran 1776. Um, and we saw that it was a, it was a large amount. It was, you know, the first month, maybe 15, 20%. And it was pretty consistent, which as we scaled, that became a rather significant number. So we we looked this current 1776 up, found him on YouTube, cross-checked our spreadsheet of the free boxes. He wasn't on there. Turns out he was actually a paying customer and he was just giving unbiased reviews. Um, this wasn't his full-time gig. He was in the HVAC industry for a couple of decades, and this was his his nighttime relax and um, hobby, if you will. But we saw this, this uh, I wouldn't say virality, but just engagement levels that were really high with his his once a month video review. Um, so that relationship just quickly blossomed. It turned into, hey, you don't have to pay anymore. We're going to send you the box for free to, hey, uh, we'll write you a check each month. Continue doing what you're doing. If you have questions, reach out to us first to try to control the narrative a little bit more. Um, and then the, the next step of it was, hey, this is kind of wild. Do you want to um, quit your career, uh, move down to Georgia um, and move your family and wife, three kids, and do this full time? Um, and he, he, he luckily, for arguably all of us, agreed, came down, and it was at that point. So that was um, towards the middle latter part of 2016. When the relationship took that that um, new form, and from that point, it was okay. We've now seen a year and a half worth of data that these unbiased organic YouTube reviews that our video are are giving us traction. We saw that his videos did the same thing, but on a higher level. So how do we leverage this? So when he came in full time, it was how much content can we do, and how much can we put out, and how can we really educate and lead and indirectly soft sell um the brand with with video and you know at the time a lot's changed since 2016 but at the time it was brandon was farm to table so he was the camera guy he was the guy in the he was the face he was the editor he was the guy posting it on social um obviously that's changed a lot but uh yeah that was the initial approach and and we just quickly saw success you know a lot of it People listening might be like, well, yeah, of course you do that. Um, but in 2015, 2016, that wasn't necessarily the the known best practice. No, absolutely. I think user-generated content was not even a word back in, in that Correct. time. Yeah. So uh, you were basically far ahead of the curve. And in 2015, 2016, there were no stories, there were no reels, there was definitely no TikTok. So all of that came much, much later. Now with all these new tools, that are around. Um, how much has your approach on video marketing changed with new platforms, with new formats, and so on and so forth? Yeah, so it's 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 changed. It's changed a lot. So, you know, back then our entire strategy was was long form, um, traditional horizontal content. You know, as we progressed, yes, we posted it on YouTube, but we would put it on all channels um, as well. The channels that could support um, long form video like Facebook, not all, not all could at the time. Now all of them can. And then as we got um, into the pandemic, you know, early 2020, we saw uh, musically become TikTok and and this TikTok app really changing the 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 way consumers digest content. So you know, early 2020, we we grabbed the battle box handle on TikTok, and then we did nothing at all with it. Um, we sat on it for for over a year and we just didn't know as we were we were watching it closely but we're not going to dance like that's all this app 
seemed at the time. Right. And we're like, okay, we're not going to dance, so what can we do? And it took us a year to finally say, okay, this seems to be evolving and it seems to be changing um, and being more than just uh, an app for dancing. So in, in February 2021, we started posting content. Um, mm -hmm. we, we did a combination of, of shooting new, you know, vertical format videos. And what we did for, honestly, the majority of our content, we took our existing horizontal long form um, and we literally edited it where it was short form vertical. So we took our existing content and we started um, editing it to be sub a, sub a minute and, and posting it on TikTok, taking different approaches, really a lot of testing and trying to find what would resonate, what would cause that virality, et cetera. The entire 2021, so all the way almost through the end of the year, we had very little success. Um, we have a win here and there, but it was one win for you know a thousand losses. And but we were getting smarter and and every time we got a win, there was a new baseline of what of what a, a bad performer would be. You know, initially it was 200 views and then we would always get a thousand views and then it just got higher and higher and the and the viral posts would do better and better. And then, you know, towards the end of 2021, we had an inflection point, a tipping point where we really had it dialed in. We knew what the content needed to be. Um, not with 100% certainty, but knowing if we put 50 videos up, we know one or two or three of them are going to perform well, which is crazy to say that that's success. But um, mm -hmm. understanding TikTok's algorithm, that's pretty close to success. So we went full gas. And around the same time as TikTok was getting normalized and, and older consumers were using it and it was more accepted and there was content that wasn't just dancing, you saw um, both Google and Facebook realize this, Meta and Alphabet, realizing that this new kid on the block is, is possibly problematic. So what they both did is they made tweaks to their algorithm. Um, they both at this point had a short form video product, um, Instagram, and I guess technically Facebook both had, both had uh, reels, and then YouTube had shorts. And they both made the algorithm treat this short form video content um, a little bit better than it probably was. If you were putting short form video mm -hmm. content out, it was going to get more views than any of the other type of content on that platform. And we realized this. So we had been working February through, you know, November, December, all of this TikTok content. Well, we have hundreds of pieces of content. So we started then putting a distribution on Instagram Reels and YouTube, or Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts, and all of a sudden we saw this, most of the same stuff that did well on TikTok was doing well there. There were nuances, some stuff was different, but we had all this content, so it was go, 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 and we ran, um, you know, by the end of that first year, we probably had um, three, 400,000 on TikTok, 300,000 on TikTok, um, but we had taken YouTube and we had 50,000 on YouTube. We were getting about 500 new subs a month. And just repurposing that content, we were able to get up to a few hundred thousand uh, in a very short order, six, eight weeks. And then Instagram, we were able to grow that as well. And, and then we just rinse and repeat. And now, um, you know, fast forward, TikTok is, keep saying we're really close to a million. Um, hopefully we will be at a million soon. I think we're at 960, 970,000. Um, YouTube, we're at uh, over 750,000. So we've really leaned in um, and, and figured it out, but it's still a work in progress. Very important thing you mentioned is whenever a platform, no matter what platform it is, they're rolling out a new feature, they're pushing it for a while, like it was with Reels and Stories, and then sort of settles in, something else come, comes new. So you need to be in the right moment with the right content to do so. Now, you said you have a lot of content, you created a lot of content for a lot of our listeners, they're small, medium enterprises, um, they probably don't have the resources. Or just give me an idea of what kind of resources, how many people did you have in the background? Was it people working internally for you or what agencies working? What was the structure behind the curtain basically to create all of this content? Sure. So yeah, so two things. So one great call out on when 
when there's a new new feature for a platform, they're gonna they're gonna push it, right? Like they put these resources and they want it to be successful. They didn't roll it out for it to fail. So it's it's keep your finger on the pulse with these things. Another and there's always new ones, right? So the first half of this year was TikTok shop. And end of last year, like everyone was talking about it and TikTok was pushing it and the algorithm again treated it better as better than it should have. And um, you know, now YouTube shopping is being rolled out. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see. They've made a couple attempts at this previously. So it'll be interesting to see if this is the new one that sticks. But if you're putting out content for it, you can know with certainty it's going to be treated better than the content actually is. So take advantage right. of it. Um, so when when I look back on, you know, behind the curtain, for the first 2016, for the first four and a half years, um, really it was just just Brandon on the team. He was the camera mm -hmm. guy. He was the face. He was the editor. He was the one that posted. Um, so he 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 owned it from from farm to table. Truly, um, as we've scaled, you know, we've added additional layers. Um, so we the first thing we did is we we had a social media manager that now schedules the posts. Um, so he just had to shoot it, film it, edit it, and then hand it off. Um, and as we and it was because we wanted to put out more content. So how do we take something off off Brandon's plate so we can put out more? And then as we wanted to continue that, we we got a full time video editor. Um, that mm -hmm. was the next next place when we did. So at that point, he's just filming it. Um, video editor edits goes to social media poster, um, and we've just continued to scale. So so now we have we have three full time video editors, and and we have oh, two okay. two full time creators, and then one and then one poster. So it was a very slow and steady scale, and we only did it as um, as it could be supported. The additional resources could be supported um, with the revenue. So very conservative mm -hmm. instead of the traditional go crazy, go big. Like we we built it very slowly over over nine years. Okay. Now I like this approach. Um so people do not need to be scared that they now need to take all the money in their hand to get a full time editor that comes over time as revenue grows. I don't yeah, and I don't think it's it's needed today. It's it's they've made it so simple sometimes with editing. There's um a tool, a free tool. They have a uh, it's a, a it's a freemium. You can buy a better version of it but cap cut um and there's some other mm. tools too where uh you can do so much editing like it's mind-blowing no, actually i want to pick up that what would happen by my next question is like what kind of tools specifically ai tools are you using to just generate more vo volume on content for for your listeners or for your viewers yeah so there's um so as far as the video editing um for ai there hasn't been a ton. We've played around with a bunch um, that that you know do some some quick edits, and um, the the reality is we haven't found one that 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 we've kept. Um, when I look at AI tools we're using for content, um, on traditional content we're using um, you know the ChatGPTs and the Clouds of the world for um, for copy, for ads, uh, for iterations. Uh, for emails, we do a lot of testing and, and you know, the it's a volume game to find what works. Um, additional AI tools we use, we'll do, we'll occasionally do, um, do voice. So whether it's, whether it's text to, um, text to voice where we're writing a script and then it's, it's read, um, that's hit or miss. We've had a lot of success with, um, as an example, we did a, a commercial spot and there was a voiceover and we didn't want to use Brandon's voice. Um, we wanted a, a, a more traditional voice and I read the script, but we didn't want my voice either. Um, so mm -hmm. I read it and then we used AI to change the tone and, and make it in a more professional, polished sounding. Okay. No, that sounds good. Now, how important... For you is the the personal aspect of branding, Brandon as the face of the brand, um, compared to just a normal marketing message going out. So I I think it's huge, right? It's not a straightforward answer. I think you have to look at a couple of things. One, you have to look at 
you know, at least for a, a direct-to-consumer brand, you have to look at where the product falls on the need-want scale. And the farther it is from absolute mission-critical need and in the want discretionary spending, I think the more important it is that you have to have some sort of connection with, with the consumer, with the buyer. And the easiest way to do that is with um, humanizing the brand. And you best way to do that is, is through a face, through a face or through almost a, um, doesn't necessarily have to be a face, but almost a behavior, like a, yeah, a certain behavior. You look at um interesting example, Wendy's on X, right? Like there's not the, I mean, yes, Wendy's the face, but there's not an actual, very rarely do you see the social media manager showing themselves, but it's this snarky mm -hmm. attitude, right? And that's kind of the brand there. For us, we we wanted a, a a human. We want to humanize it. Brandon has an amazing persona and personality, and it's very contagious. And um, and he truly loves the gear. So it's like a, it's a match made in heaven, right? He gets to talk and show this amazing gear. Um, so it just obviously resonates because he's not unique in in the passion for outdoor gear. Before we come to the end of the coffee break today, I want to ask you about the outlook, how video, obviously, I think, in my opinion, is, is one of the most important marketing ways right now and going forward as well. How do you see other ways of content marketing um, still surviving, like blog posts? Will that be something that will survive or will it vanish? Or how, what do you see coming up or leaving the marketing plate? So, so I think video will continue being very important, as you stated, um, it, it's just an easy way to quickly digest content. And, and it's really apparent, you know, across the globe that, that people like video content, people like to scroll on their phone and see multiple topics fairly quickly. Short attention span is, is the reality. Do I think the other forms of content go away? I don't. I think sometimes you do need traditional copy to to convey a message it needs a lot of times marketing messages do need to be read and yes you can put it as subtitles on a video but i don't think we're at the point where people don't read the actual text copy as far as blog posts um and articles i don't think we're at a place where they're going away either i would think that they still serve a huge purpose so you look at um the obvious traditional seo reasons right where where people are googling or searching and and that content matters because the algorithm isn't at the point where it's only ingesting video and then extrapolating that into text now we might get there at some point um mm -hmm. but further validation of, of articles is you know you're seeing google search queries go down and and chat gpt and other ai search tools um you know open ai is rolling out their new search um right. tool which is which is interesting but all that's doing is is finding the answer but again it's not ingesting a lot of video and extrapolating it it's looking for actual text copy um mm -hmm. so i think until ai gets to the point where it's just video ingestion and it can accomplish the same i don't think text is going anywhere anytime soon so i think all of that copy still matters matters greatly Okay, so the workload for our marketers out listening here is you still have to do the hard you work. Do, you have to do everything. Blog post. You have yeah. to do everything. Now, now but to your point, there, there, there are there are AI tools where you can um, dump a video in and get some great mm -hmm. copy. So I think there's still ways to work smarter. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's key is, is using AI to work smarter. I'm using AI as you basically on the same level what you mentioned before all the tools every day all the and it just makes your life so much easier and saves so much time and um, i think sometimes even the quality is much better than what i would do on my own <laughs> so same. from there ai is, is definitely helping there now you're also sharing a lot of um help for merchants out there on a podcast and on your own blog tell me a little bit about that sure um so yeah so the my blog is onlinecaso.com the approach towards there is that you see a lot of, um, you know, especially on X, a lot on LinkedIn too, where people are only sharing wins and 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 successes. And I think that's a little toxic and not realistic. The reality is um, most people have a lot more losses than they have wins. And those losses are 
arguably more important because that's where the learnings are. That's how you get the information you need to attempt again to get that win. So really the a lot of the blog is is focusing on learnings and losses and and more education and less less bragging. Um and the pod the podcast, so the the awesome podcast, awesome spelled A S O M, um, is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an e-commerce centric podcast. The the focus is interesting because it takes four different perspectives. So the A stands for agency. Um, so it's someone that runs an agency. Uh, S stands for SaaS, software as a service. So someone that runs a software brand. Uh, o is operator, runs a e-com direct to consumer brand. And M is marketer. So it's four different approaches towards you know problems in e-commerce. And it's wild that so many things are looked at completely different um, by the you know different pillars of the industry. So it tries to Absolutely, give you a well yeah. well rounded a well rounded answer to a problem. Absolutely, I think this is a very good approach. I'm a marketer, online marketer for 25 years. When I talk to agency owners, eh, it's a different world over there. Anyway. It is. <laughs> it, it's a totally different world, and sometimes we're not speaking the same language. So this hopes to like kind of bridge it together. Yeah, very good approach. I like that. Where can people find out more about you guys? The podcast is asompod.com, mm -hmm. awesomepod.com. We're on all social media channels. For myself, LinkedIn is is where where I'm the best at and the 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 most active. I'm not not very good at X. Okay, cool. Before we come to the end of the coffee break today, is there one final thought that you want to leave our listeners with? I would say on on the going back to the content piece. I think it's it's human nature and really easy to get paralysis by analysis and think that your content has to be perfect. Um, the reality is just hit the record button. Sometimes you don't even have to edit. Just go. I think the concept that content has to be polished is is false. Actually, consumers and people digesting content appreciate when something is more real and genuine. So yes, use CapCut, use a video editor if it's if it's easy and free, but don't get lost in it. Don't think you have to make this perfect finished product because the the raw stuff, the genuine stuff where you can tell it's user generated and it's not some big organization making it, the the real stuff performs better. And that perform it performs better on on B2B, it performs better on D2C. Um People want that that human touch, that that human element from everything. So just go. No, I think that's that. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. It definitely uh, makes the life of the big Coca Cola's brands out of the world very difficult because now one of a sudden you as a small DTC brand can compete with them and right. even be better than what yeah. they produce. And I think that's a big advantage in today's market. John, thanks so much for your time today. Um, I will put the links in the show notes as always, so you will be only one click away. And uh, I hope a lot of listeners will reach out to you and check out what you do on your blog, on your podcast, and also check out your brand to see the long way where you have come. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.